Let's take a look at rotational kinematics. Earlier in the course, we studied linear kinematics. And there were three basic quantities that kind of kept track of the motion of objects. One of them kept track of where the object is, how far it is away, and in what direction. And that was the displacement. A second quantity kind of tracked how fast that object was moving. And that was called the velocity. And it was equal to the rate of change of displacement. And then there was a third quantity that kept track of how fast the speed was changing. And that was called the acceleration. And that would equal the rate of change of velocity. Now, similarly, we're going to need three quantities to keep track of rotational motion. So let's suppose this rod rotates. First thing we're going to want to keep track of is how far it rotates. And we could do that very simply using this angle here. And that angle, theta, is called the angular displacement. We could use degrees to measure that angle theta. Turns out it's more natural and easier if we use radians to measure that angle theta. Secondly, we'd like to know how fast is our object rotating. And we keep track of that using a quantity omega, which is called the angular velocity. It's really the same omega that we used in simple harmonic motion, where we called it the angular frequency. It's really one and the same. And it's going to be equal to the rate of change of angular displacement. Its units are going to be radians per second. And then we're going to need a third quantity that's going to keep track of how fast is that rotational rate changing. And we're going to use an alpha to represent that. It's going to be called the angular acceleration. And it's going to be equal to the rate of change of the angular velocity. And its units are going to be radians per second every second. Or we could just say radians per second squared. So you can see there's a direct parallel between linear motion and rotational motion. And in fact, mathematically, they're really identical. Now we're going to be using radians a lot, so let's very briefly review what a radian is. So let's say I've got a circle here, and I've got an angle in that circle. I'm going to try to draw that angle such that that angle is one radian. Now, it's only going to truly be one radian if this length here, that arc length, is exactly the same size as the radius. And what that implies is that if you have an angle that goes all the way around the circle, then that angle is going to be 2 pi radians, simply because there's 2 pi radii in the circumference of a circle. And I think it's helpful to visualize this. This arc length here is one radius. So there's one radian. There's two radians. There's approximately three radians. Four radians. Five radians. And six radians. Six radians and a little bit here. Well, 2 pi is what? 6.28? So you can fit just over six radii into the circumference of a circle. So once around the circle is 6.28 radians. Now I've got a few examples to help you to become a little more familiar with using these rotational quantities. So here's a question from Giancali. Pause the video, try it out for yourself, come back for the answer. Okay, I've drawn the basic quantities. Here's our beam. You can see that it's spreading out. Now, what we're actually asked for in the question is this distance here. But by and large, being as this is a very small angle, that's exactly the same as the arc length. And we know the arc length is given by the angle in radians times the length of the radius. So we can multiply and work that out. The angle is 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5 radians 
and we're going to multiply that by the radius, which is 380,000 kilometers. And if you want, that would be per radius. And in effect, these these units of radians and radius are going to cancel each other out. So you'll get an answer in kilometers, which is what you want, of course. And I think if you work that out, you're going to get 6.5 kilometers. So our beam is going to cover 6.5 kilometers on the surface of the moon. Let's try another question. Pause the video, try the question, come back for the answer. Okay, so we're searching for this angular velocity. And the units for that are going to be radians per second. So let's think about what this arc length is going to be in one second. If it's moving at 10 meters per second, then in one second, this distance here would be 10 meters. So this would be 10 meters in one second. That arc length. Now, 10 meters is only one-fifth of the radius, 50 meters. And that means this angle here is going to have to be 10 divided by 50, or 0 0.2 radians. In other words, our angular velocity is going to be 0 0.2 radians, and that was done in one second. So it's 0 0.2 radians per second. Part B, let's find out how many revolutions would be done in one second, and then we'll multiply that by 30 to figure out how many revolutions there'd be in 30 seconds. So revolutions in one second. Well, we know the radians. It's 0 0.2 radians in one second. And now we've just got to multiply by the number of revolutions in a radian. Of course, 2 pi radians is equal to 1 revolution. Multiply that out. Of course, the radians are going to cancel out. You're going to get revolutions per second. And it comes out to be 0 0.032 revolutions in one second. So the revolutions in 30 seconds is just going to be 30 times that. And you should get almost a full revolution, 0 0.96 revolutions. What I'd like you to do now is to indulge me for a minute. This is an old kinematics problem. Pause the video. Try the question, come back for the answer. There's different ways of doing this problem. I realized that time was not involved in this particular problem, so I could use the no time equation, which was that v squared equals u squared plus 2as, where s is the displacement. And I'm using the standard ib variables in this equation. So now I can plug in everything I know. I have an initial speed of 20 meters per second. My acceleration is downwards at 10, and my displacement is 5. If I work that out, I get that v should be equal to 14.4 meters per second. There's two answers because it could be going upwards at 14.4 or be coming downwards at 14.4. Okay, so be it. Now what we're going to do is a parallel problem, but this time it's going to involve uniform angular acceleration. And I think you're going to see, if you were good at solving those kinematic equations, you're going to be just as good at solving these rotational equations. So I've written down our kinematic equations when we have uniform acceleration. What I'm now going to do is transform them into the rotational equations when we have uniform angular acceleration. And all I need to do there is Wherever I see a displacement, I'm going to change it to an angular displacement. Whenever I see a velocity, I would change that to an angular velocity. And we would have a final angular velocity to go with the final angular speed and a initial angular velocity as well. And whenever we see an acceleration, we're going to transform it into an angular acceleration. So mathematically, uniform acceleration and uniform a angular acceleration are identical. The only difference is in the physical quantities themselves. So I'm going to write down the transformed first equation. Then I'd like you to pause the video and try to write down the rest of the equations and then come back for the answers.
So our first equation would be that the angular displacement is equal to that initial angular speed times t plus one half angular acceleration times t squared. So pause the video, try it, come back for the answer. Okay, there they are. Check if your answers are correct. So here's an example of a uniform angular acceleration problem. What I'd like you to do is to see if you can work it out by choosing the appropriate rotational kinematic equation. So pause the video, try the question, come back for the answer. Hopefully you realize this particular problem didn't involve time, so we could use the corresponding no time equation, which would be that final angular velocity squared would equal the initial angular velocity squared plus two times the angular acceleration times the angular displacement. So now we can put our values in. Our initial angular velocity was 20. Our angular acceleration is going to be negative because the object's slowing down at negative 10. And our angular displacement is going to be 5 radians. So I think you can see that mathematically this is identical to the linear problem that we did earlier. And so the final angular velocity is going to be 14.4 radians per second. And in this particular case, the negative 14.4 radian per second solution is not physical. And the reason for that is that friction is going to bring our rotation to a stop. It's not going to bring it to a stop and then speed it up in the opposite direction again. But hopefully you can see this direct parallel between the linear kinematic equations and the rotational kinematic equations. If you know how to do one, you know how to do the other just as well. So in the same way that we can do graphs against time of displacement, velocity, and acceleration, we can do graphs against time of angular displacement, angular velocity, and angular acceleration against time. So in that last example, we had a constant rate of angular acceleration, and that rate was negative 10. So it was losing 10 radians per second of angular velocity every second. It started with an initial angular velocity of 20. And then one second later, it would have dropped down to 10, and then the rotation would have stopped after two seconds. So this is zero seconds, one second, two seconds, and we get a linear drop in that angular velocity. In terms of the angular displacement, well, the area under this curve is a half base times height, which comes out to be 20 radians. And that means after two seconds, the object will have rotated through 20 radians. And once again, you're going to get that parabolic shape. Steep slope in the beginning, because it's rotating quickly. A slope near zero near the end here, because it's rotating very, very slowly until it comes to a stop. So that's what the rotational kinematics graphs would look like. So all of this can be summarized by saying that those equations that we had for uniform acceleration, they can all be transformed so that you get a series of equations for uniform angular acceleration. And then you can treat it exactly the same. So all that you learned for uniform acceleration can now be applied to uniform angular acceleration. And that's all for today, folks. Thank you very much.